Travis Cook, America's evil genius of TruthFrequencyRadio.com, 90.7 FM in Denver, 97.3 FM in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, wanting to deliver a little bit of a message to you today. And this, this piece right here that we're doing may possibly air on the Tuesday radio show uh, this upcoming Tuesday. I'm not sure yet. It depends on what all happens between now and then. But I'm recording it on Thursday morning after the debates of Wednesday night. And I wanted to at least put it out there for those of you who follow me on social media and on the internet, uh, you know, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, those sorts of things. And uh, we may also include what I'm about to say on the radio show in a few days. Uh, it all kind of depends. But really what I want to focus on was uh, a little bit about the debate last night on Wednesday night. Um, it's interesting to me as I'm hearing all of the analysis this morning on the cable news channels and the, the newspapers and whatnot that uh, nobody's really talking very much about the majority of the debate where Trump appeared to essentially wipe the floor with Hillary Clinton and where at times Hillary seemed like she was making the case for Donald Trump even better than Trump was. I, I, I was Facebook messaged by a friend of mine, Mark Beck, last night uh, who asked me at one point, he's like, is Hillary making the case for Trump? And, and of course, I don't think she intentionally was, but... Uh, by the way she was going about, she was certainly making Trump sound like the more reasonable alternative. I mean, you had Hillary out there uh, trying to make partial birth abortion sound sympathetic of all things. And I guarantee you when she did that, most of us in the Midwest and the South were just aghast when we heard that. that, that that's incomprehensible. And here she is trying to put a, a, a positive spin, a positive face on partial birth abortion. Oh, my God. Uh, she was out there trying to maintain that she's in favor of the, of the Second Amendment when also being in favor of so-called reasonable gun regulations. Uh, I'm sorry, those are, are opposite statements. That's an oxymoron. You cannot be in favor of both of those. You know, and, and, it, and it is odd that uh, Hillary seems to, to think that uh, toddlers need to be protected from guns but not from partial birth abortion. That seems kind of odd. Also seems odd that uh, more importantly and more more critically that the families of those who have toddlers, those single mothers out there, those young couples, young families who need to protect themselves and protect that toddler uh, from the criminals in the world, the evildoers in the world, that they should have more restrictions placed upon them in, in obtaining a firearm. That that should happen, but hey, partial birth abortion, that's all good. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely noticed that last night, and it, it certainly seemed when you took everything together that Hillary was making the case for Trump. At one time, actually, she made this this play about Trump's uh, tax plan that it would be like uh, like trickle down economics on steroids, I believe were her words. And I'm sitting here thinking, wait a second, I grew up in the 1980s. I lived through the 1980s. They were pretty darn sweet. I remember my family making tremendous strides in the 1980s in terms of our uh, situation and, and our you know finances and, and lifestyle and so forth. So yeah, bring some more of that on. Some of us have been asking for that for 30 years. So I thought when she's trying to, to tell us that trickle down on steroids is what's coming with Trump, I'm, I'm thinking, well, by God, I am voting for him now. Thank you, Hillary. But none of that is what the media is talking about this morning. Instead, what the media seems to be completely obsessed about is the one question about uh, will Trump accept the results of the election? And he was noncommittal on it, as I thought he should be. And people are making this big stink about, oh, it's a tradition of our democracy. First of all, we don't have a democracy. We have a republic. But it's a tradition of our democratic tra our democratic way of life that we have peaceful changeover of power and that the losing candidate accepts the results. Blah, 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 blah. That's what everybody, including Fox News, who's become a network that's kind of traitorous to the conservative cause, it seems like, as of late. Uh, that's the uh, that's the mentality that most of those networks are are bringing to the table here uh, regarding that question, and I don't think that's right at all. I I, I look back at some of the uh, examples they've used in the past. They've uh, tried to bring up the examples of Al Gore in 2000 and Richard Nixon in 1960. Well, first of all, Al Gore in 2000 was anything but conciliatory. I mean, come on. Uh, the guy tried to invent new rules out of whole cloth. He tried to change the rules in the middle of the game. He tried to get the state of Florida to go outside of its constitution and invent votes where they did not exist. Yeah, that's anything but conciliatory. And by the way, if you if you doubt me or if you want some more information on it or you, it's been so long ago you don't remember it, go check out Mark Levin's great book, Men in Black. They have a whole chapter where they go painstakingly step-by-step step, 
through everything that happened in the process and all of the chicanery that Al Gore tried to pull off in 2000. So no, Al Gore was anything uh, but conciliatory. He and his supporters have not been conciliatory since that time. You still hear Democrats out there saying selected, not elected, even though that was not the case. You even saw Hillary Clinton out there at a fundraiser in 2002, way back then, a couple of years after the, the election, where she advised people not to accept the results of the 2000 election. So uh, it's not exactly as though the potential of Donald Trump not accepting the results of the upcoming election would be out of uh, standard or, or it would be without precedent. It certainly would be. But the other example people often use is Richard Nixon in 1960, when he was provided with credible evidence on the night of the election that there had been some fraud, some chicanery, some dirty pool, if you will, not only in Chicago and in the state of Illinois, which has kind of become part of, of, of historical lore, I suppose, uh, that we all kind of acknowledge as, okay, something fishy went on there, but even in other states, such as Texas, where Lyndon Johnson was involved, there was actually a very good case that... Uh, daddy kennedy had stolen the election and nixon chose not to pursue it his reasoning being that uh well we're in the middle of the cold war we need to have a peaceful transition we we, we can't afford this we can't afford to be in a situation where there's this uh, fight over power when we're in such a critical uh critical state in the world and he bowed out he stood down and we have been told over the last 24 to 48 hours since the debate that that was a great example Probably the only time I've heard American journalists uh, praise Richard Nixon for anything during my lifetime. But suddenly, they're all fans of Richard Nixon this morning. And we're told that's the way it should have gone, that it's the way it should go. Well, I have a different take on that. Because, let's face it, for whatever we think of someone being magnanimous, or whatever we might think of somebody uh, being gracious in defeat, or whatever there are real life implications for these decisions there are things that happen as a result down the line that are very important and let us think back to 1960 what might have happened how might things have been different if richard nixon had not gracefully bowed out if richard nixon had fought it and if possibly he would have ended up becoming the president True, it would have divided the American people, but the American people were already divided at that time. This, this idea that John F. Kennedy magically healed America and brought us all together is complete poppycock and hogwash to anyone who's ever actually studied history. I know that's the mythology that's been put forth, but that's not the case. America was very divided over Kennedy, and that only, that only expanded during his presidency to the point that by the time he was killed... There was a great divide in America, and that would be exacerbated as the 1960s went on. Uh, so that is a myth. We were divided anyway. But think of what a Nixon presidency in 1960 might have done. And it's all speculation. I understand that. But you look at, you look at the decade of the 1960s and, and how destructive that I've always argued they were. The 1960s, in my mind, were the most destructive decade in American history in terms of the American people, a good number of them anyway, turning their back on the traditions and morals that made this country great, and in certain people being allowed to take hold of the process in America and lead us down some very destructive roads for which we are still suffering the consequences today. So much of what we consider the social justice movement and, and those sorts of things really took hold in the 1960s. So much of the problems that our urban communities face took hold in the 1960s by way of Lyndon Johnson's Great Society. So let's consider what might have been with a Richard, Ni Richard Nixon 1960 presidency. Well, one would think that a lot of the, a lot of the uh, direction of America would have been far different. I mean, when Nixon got into office in 1968, so much of the idea was to restore America to what we knew had, had been right. And in 1968, when Nixon run, he had seen, and America had seen, the destructiveness of those seven or eight years of liberalism, of, of Kennedy and Johnson. They saw the violence in the streets. They saw the violence on college campuses. They saw the race riots and so forth. And they saw that. They saw that in, in the rearview mirror. But with, if Nixon's president in 1960, maybe we don't ever even go there to begin with. My God, how much better would that have been? Maybe the civil rights movement and this is going to be controversial for some of you, but maybe the civil rights movement in the 1960s does not ever gain the steam that it did starting with Kennedy and certainly with Lyndon Johnson. And I've always said that while the civil rights movement had some salient points, 
There's a lot of destructiveness that came out of it as well, and we're seeing a lot of that today in our Fergusons in America, in, in these many situations where cops are under, uh, are under assault in America by our urban, urban thugs. Uh, a lot of that really takes its place back to the civil rights movement of the 60s. Vietnam, well, who knows how that would have gone, but Kennedy really ratcheted that up. Nixon might have too, we don't know. Nixon was always one to, to use whatever he could to, to get what he wanted in terms of, of foreign policy. So I don't know what would have happened with Vietnam with Nixon. But in terms of American culture on the forefront, we, I, I'm confident to say that with the Richard Nixon presidency in 1960, we would not have strayed as far away from our core values as we did in the 1960s. We would not have become as accepting and tolerant of dangerous and abhorrent behaviors and ideas in the 1960s as we did. Maybe some of the things that happened on our college campuses and continue to persist to this day would never have gotten started in the 1960s. It's all speculation, of course. But as I look at it, and I look at how the 1960s turned out, through the benefit of hindsight, if you will, I really wish Richard Nixon would have fought it. And I know it's, it, it's, it's probably unfair to lay all of this at the feet of John F. Kennedy, and, and, and that's probably true. He wasn't responsible for all of it, but he certainly was responsible for getting America started in that direction. And many people beyond him uh, followed through on that and expanded that even through the 1960s and even today. One could say Hillary Clinton's trying to do it now. Barack Obama did it during the last eight years. So uh, yeah, if that could have been nipped in the bud, if that change in liberalism, if that onslaught of liberalism in the 1960s could have been nipped in the bud, I'd say we'd all be better off today. So yeah, Nixon should have fought. Nixon shouldn't have accepted those results because we see today, we see the repercussions of it. And so I think going forward, what would be the repercussions of a Hillary Clinton presidency? Well, you heard a lot of it during the debate. An assault on our gun rights, more killing of babies, a situation in which she doesn't even recognize, it seems, the danger of, of militant Islam and uh, Islamic terrorism, but suddenly thinks that Russia is a bigger threat to us than they are. Are you kidding? Yeah, that's what's coming, folks. An era in which our corporations are wealthy, our job creators are taxed to the point that they don't invest anymore, that's what's coming. So yeah, given those long-term repercussions, I can't speak for Donald Trump, but I darn sure will not accept the results of this election if Hillary wins by hook or by crook. And by what we've seen out of WikiLeaks and some of the evidence going around, the likelihood is far more by crook than uh, by hook. So no, I'm not going to accept it. And I have said all along, and I've been saying it for over a year on my radio show, that if Hillary Clinton wins this election somehow, that the time has come for secession. Because America will no longer be America under 12 years of Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. Yes, there will be a landmass called the United States of America, but it will not be America in the principles, in the morals, in the founding and guiding pillars that we've based ourselves off, off of for over 200 years. It'll be a different country entirely and one that I don't want to be a part of. So I know there's talk out there of, of possible violence and uh, possible overthrow of the government and those sorts of things if Hillary wins the election. I'm not willing to take those off the table, but I think the best alternative is secession to avoid a lot of that violence. And so that some of these states, some of these good states that have never voted for any of this mess over the years, some of the states in the South and maybe the Midwest, maybe we go our own way, maybe we seek our own independence and maybe we leave, uh, we leave those crazy liberals like Hillary Clinton to their own devices in the North and the West and let them have at it, you know? And we go our own way and we do things the right way. That's what I'm advocating. Uh, in the case of Hillary Clinton election. So no, I'm certainly not going to accept a Hillary Clinton win. And Donald Trump, I don't think he should either, particularly in the likely event that such a win will come about by way of nefarious means, by way of voter fraud. I mean, look at the people that Democrats are always trying to get election rights expanded to. They always want expanded election rights to young people who don't know any better, to illegal aliens who aren't in tune with our culture and who aren't uh, here to assimilate, that tells you everything you need to know about the direction that Democrats want to take this country. They don't want you and I making the decisions in this country. They want young people, they want criminals, they want illegal aliens, they want people with backgrounds other than American to form the direction of this nation.
That tells you all you need to know. And in closing, I would say this in a more general sense. You know, on the general subject of voting, we as a nation have over 150 years, we've really gone the route of expanding the voting rules, of trying to do different things to expand the right to vote, you know, to women or to blacks or to whomever, or to, to remove obstacles from voting, removing things like poll taxes and literacy tests and things like that. And, and we've largely done that over over 150 years. But sometimes I wonder if that has had a good end result or not. And we're seeing a lot of people try to vote today, and they have the legal right to vote, who, who really do us no good and do our nation no good in their decision making. They do us more harm than good. Maybe, just maybe, it's time to start looking at the next 150 years and looking at a way to kind of reduce the total number of people who vote. And I know we're light years away from that, but maybe constitutional amendments that start to chip away at some of these some of these rights. And I'm not saying take away the right to vote from women or from blacks or anything, but maybe maybe further clarify it that you know certain people will be allowed the right to vote, certain people will not. My personal viewpoint has always been the best way to handle it would be to only allow the right to vote to law to uh, to uh, American citizens who are landowners over the age of 30. I think that would be the best possible uh, result for our voting rights. And I know we're a long way from that. It's going to take a constitutional amendment or several constitutional amendments to do it. But I'm telling you, I think that's the general direction we need to go in if this nation is to survive. So, folks, that's my thoughts on, on this uh, controversy, as, as it were. Travis Cook, America's Evil Genius, TruthFrequencyRadio.com. And we'll see you when we see you.